Good morning, everyone. I'm Tara Thomas, formerly of KWWL, now the Director of School and Community Relations for the Waterloo Schools. I'm so excited to have this opportunity to share a couple times a month during the school year with folks in the community, as well as so many people who are key elements, components, individuals helping shape the Waterloo School community and, and the district. And we want to be able to bring you directly up front, up close, personal with some of the people that are making these decisions that are affecting you and your families. And the first person up in my first endeavor to carry out this interview segment is a friend, a woman who's become a friend. Her name is Kathy Corbett, and she is heading up all things busing through Durham for the Waterloo Schools. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, how are you? I'm doing well, and we thank you for taking time out of what is often a busy call center over there at the bus farm, where you're fielding a lot of calls, questions, and concerns. We all know it's, the, it's not the elephant in the room that there have been, I guess, there's been some angst with busing insofar as how parents have perceived what the district has done uh, change-wise, where the routes and the assignments are concerned this year. So we're going to get into that. We've got Kathy pinned down here for 15 minutes, but before we cover some of these issues, just tell us what is your title, what's your background, how did you land as the head of, of this school busing well, situation? Actually, I'm the general manager for Durham School Services. I started out as a bus driver, so I've been on the road and I've been behind the wheel of the bus. Um, I've been in the transportation industry for about 15 years. When I went from being a bus driver, I went to a safety manager to a training area, and so I've also experienced the safety part of our business. And now I am working as the manager for the company. I've kind of worked my way up. And talk about how it's been going, because to hear Kathy tell it, she is, and many of her staff, are burning the midnight oil, so to speak, just to ensure that all of these issues that people have presented with you folks are being ironed out and addressed. Talk about how that process is going. Well, you know, startups are always rough. Every year we have a startup and every year we have to get the kids where they need to be. And the first couple of weeks are always rough, but it's starting to settle down now. Um, my staff has been working pretty hard to get everybody where they need to be. Um, right now we're looking at fine tuning some of the routes and cleaning up anything that's left, you know, kids, making sure kids are where they're supposed to be and that everybody's there on time. The other thing, the next thing that we're working on is we're going through all the routes and reviewing safety issues. We have a process where we have the drivers kind of evaluate their route, and if there's anything on their route that they feel is unsafe or uncomfortable, we go through those routes with them and we reroute or take care of any issues that we need to. Um, another big issue with the district right now is that we had a lot of paid, we had hundreds and hundreds of paid and daycare requests that came in. And we did get a little backlogged with those, but I believe we, after my staff worked all weekend last weekend, we got them all caught up, and so those all should be taken care of now. And they're notifying the parents if they were denied. Um, we notified the parents, we called them all, if they got daycare or transportation requests, if they were denied, our router's going through them one last time to see if we can make sure that there's no transportation available, and then we're notifying those parents. And let's talk more about how that process works in terms of who's eligible, because many grandparents and parents have said, hey, my child or my student in the past was eligible for this particular service or this particular route, but what we do know is that there is a law laid out and the policies that have to be followed. So just explain what some of those eligibility rules are so people get you know, how these, I guess, rulings are coming down. Well, I think it's really important that we understand that not too much has actually changed. We're just really trying hard to enforce the policies that we have. And it begins with the state of Iowa, and there's eligibility requirements for the state of Iowa. And those requirements are is that K through 8 have two miles. So if you are two, less than two miles to the school, you are not eligible for transportation according to the state. Now, if you are in high school, which is the 9 through 12 group, you have three miles of, to be eligible for this transportation. Um, I'm kind of happy with the Waterloo School District and I feel very good about the fact that they're willing to actually lower that standard a little bit so they put K through five and they're eligible if they're under a mile. So, so, they're, they're so walking the state is saying, sorry to interrupt, but the state is saying, hey, we don't have to provide transportation within a two mile radius, but the Waterloo School System is actually saying, we want to give younger kids that opportunity, so we're cutting it off at one mile. That's so that is a distinction that's worth noting because yeah. we're giving more people the opportunity for ridership 
than what the state even requires us to do. That's correct. So once we determined eligibility for that, all those kids got routed first because those are the ones that are eligible for buses. Now we also want to give as much chance as possible to get transportation and use everything that we have to provide as many kids as possible. So the district has some business rules that we're working on enforcing here. And those involve paid transportation and daycare transportation. And the paid transportation, there needs to be an existing stop, there has to be a bus route, and that bus also cannot be full. And if those things exist, we can add kids for a fee, and I believe it's $55 a month, the kids can be added to that route and they can still get a ride to school. Um, daycare transportation is the same rules, the only thing is, is that it has to be a licensed daycare for them to be able to be eligible for that transportation. Um, we can't create stops for those character, you know, for those two programs, but we can get them on as good as we can. And we should mention that some of getting the process, or some of getting these requests processed was hinging on how early folks turned in their paperwork. Well, you know, some of the folks turned them in really early in the summer and they were a little concerned because they hadn't gotten their information yet. But we can't actually route those kids until all the kids that are eligible are routed, so that means we have to wait for kind of registration to come in yeah, yeah. and anybody that's new. So um, really we couldn't start running those kids until like right before or right about the time that school started. Okay. But just so you know, we made sure that we labeled those kids as first come, first serve because the transportation is awarded that way. So we kept track of dates and we did the pile from beginning to end, first come, first serve. That's good to know. So if you get it in early and you make that effort, you are not going to be pushed to the bottom of the pile, so to speak, right. once you're able to process the request. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Hey, if you're just joining us, this is Tara Thomas with Waterloo Schools. I'm joined by Kathy Corbett. She is the transportation guru, we'll call it, all things busing for the Waterloo School District. And hey, if you're not interested in busing because your child or your grandchild isn't riding a Waterloo bus, hang tight because we've got the new Cunningham principal coming up here in the back half of our half hour. So don't go anywhere for that. Now, Kathy, you stay put because I have a couple more things to cover with you. Any issues that you feel need to be addressed? There are a lot out there that I think were perpetuated as often as the case sometimes through Facebook, social media. I mean, there's that word of mouth, talking to your neighbor, your friend at church. So what would you like to kind of squash rumor-wise or clear up once and for all if given this opportunity? Well, I think the most important thing or that's important to me is to thank the parents who've been patient and helpful and have called us and, and waited their turn for everything that they needed. And I really appreciate that, and that's my staff really appreciates that. Um, the biggest rumor that I've heard is that I've had parents call me and say, well, I bet your kid has a bus, and I just want to make sure you know my kid doesn't have a bus either because he doesn't fit in those business rules. And you have a high school student. I do. He, I, advise, I won't tell you where he goes because I don't want to embarrass him, but he's, he's not eligible, so he has to walk about 1.92 miles every day to go to school unless my husband gets home and can give him a ride. So I do feel your pain if you're a parent. Um, there's a couple things that I wanted to talk about about safety, if that's okay. I have um, a bunch of buses on the road, and they have these lovely yellow lights, and when those yellow lights start flashing, that means that there's kids that are about to get on or off a bus. So you need to slow down and make sure that you stop for that bus, and then as the door opens on the bus, the stop bar comes out, and so those kids are getting on or getting off. But especially in the mornings, you know, the, the kids are waiting. They could try and run for the bus. And anybody who runs those crossing arms or runs those stop arms is risking a chance of hitting a kid. And I want to make sure that not only that, but there's consequences involving their licenses and things that could really be disturbing to them. Um, I just want to make sure that we're very careful about that and we observe those stop arms and those lights so that we get stopped. Um, and especially speed zones in areas like around the school districts, you know, we have a brand new school out there, a beautiful new school, Orange, and the speed zone is 25 miles an hour, and we're not used to that because we've been able to drive through there a little bit faster than that. So I'd like to make sure everybody slows down for those things. Okay, and then there's a community service component that listeners would be interested to hear more about, where Durham is asking for, I guess, help to be a good neighbor. Talk about that. Well, I one of the, you know it's been kind of a stressful few weeks, and I'd really like to find something that we can do and. Um, Durham has a program where we do an adopt-to-school program, and I was out at Elkhorn Preschool the other day, and they have this lovely room that if it were filled up with books and it were filled up with color and um, cozy stuff, we could make a really nice library for them out there. 
So we've adopted that project with my drivers, and we're asking if you have any n new or gently used children's books, zero to eight, early learning, um, like those board books, um, anything that would be appropriate for a preschool children's library. Um, they're also looking for some children's furniture. Now we don't want like bean bags or stuff like that because that's got little tiny pills in it that the kids could eat or put places sure, that they shouldn't sure. be. But um, anything, you know, the foam stuff that's nice, um, anything that would be helpful for that library. If you have something and you want to bring it out to the bus garage, if it's a big load, you are more than welcome to come out there. We're usually there till at least five at night. If it's a small load and you just want to hand it off to your driver, you can hand it and they'll bring it in to us. But we're going to try and build a library for Alcorn Preschool. It's kind of a thing that I really want to do very badly. I think it would be a really good project for us. Well, I think it's awesome, and I appreciate you wanting to do something with a community service component when we know that all of us get busy, we all have responsibilities. And when I saw that stack in your office of all of those applications and all those issues that, that had to be processed, I can feel your pain from the standpoint of your, you and your staff, you're only so many people with so many hours and your commitment is to get back and smooth out everybody's situation. But in this case, patience definitely has to come into play here. Absolutely. When you have, you know, so many obligations that can't be processed overnight. And, and to that point, I guess I would just give you this opportunity as well to say something that I know about Kathy is when calls have come into my office, to the office of some of the other administrators, we are able to then pass on those messages, those names, those phone numbers directly to Kathy and her staff. And I can tell you that they are consistently, effectively going through, trying to get you know the call back and resolve whatever issue. So I think sometimes, understandably, the public perception is that we are these inaccessible uh, you know, administrators behind a wall where we're shutting out that opportunity for the public to connect with us via face-to-face, -face, even, or over the phone. So sort of open up that dialogue and just tell us why that is not the case with Durham and with your involvement thus far? Well, you know, like I said, I was a bus driver that was out on the road, so I know what the issues are with the bus drivers. Um, the parents that are calling us and talking to us, um, I'm doing my best to call them back. Personally, if I need to, you know, we try and resolve it with our staff. I really want to hear, and I'm a mom too, I know how scary it is with the kids and if somebody's missing or if you're not sure where they are, um, I can be out there and, and help out and see what we can do. It may not be me personally, because obviously I can't call everybody back, but we're doing the best that we can to get them back as quickly as possible. And this is about safety as the overarching theme here. It is dangerous when any child is out on a road, is being transported uh, to and from anywhere, be it by a parent or by a bus. I mean, obviously, when you consider all of the factors out of our control, we want to put everything in place to be as proactive as possible so that we can foresee any possible issues and resolve those before problems arise. And so I just commend you and your staff. I had heard from a lot of folks, a lot of you know, talk, I guess, chatter about the busing issue. And so I went down and talked with Kathy directly and we had a wonderful conversation and it just really helped educate me about a lot of things that I really didn't feel were being communicated effectively outward to the community. So I so appreciate you taking this time to just share some of this and just break it down so that people get that you are a one person, but you have the staff, you're all working hard, and we want to make everybody's ride to and from school, if they are eligible or are paying for that bus transportation, we want to make it as smooth of a process as possible to get your child or your grandchild to and from in the shortest amount of time Absolutely. so we can get them in the classroom because that's where we want them to be. Definitely. So thank you so much, Kathy. And one final point, what would you like to say just when you have this last 30 seconds of airtime to kind of summarize where you guys are going from here with the busing? Well, I think we have a lot of new ideas that I want to try for next year, you know, to make things a little bit more smooth. Um, I want to make sure that the routes, you know, if you give us some time to make sure that those routes are all safe and everything is good. Um, and we want to have focus on an ongoing safety program now that things are starting to settle down. We're focusing on the training with our drivers, um, making sure that our buses are on the road and that they're doing the safest thing possible. So if there's anybody that has suggestions, um, route time is not a good time to call us because we're dealing with the routes. But between 9.30 and about 12.30, we are loving to hear anything that we have to say or that any ideas that the public has to give us.
Thank you, and thanks for stopping by to spend some time with me. We'll be right back with Craig Sadler, the new principal at Dr. Walter Cunningham School for Excellence. Stay tuned. Okay, and we are back. This is Terry Thomas. Thanks for staying with us. Or if you're just joining us, I'm the Waterloo Communications Director, my official title, Director of School and Community Relations, formerly of KWWL, if you recognize the sound of my voice. And I'm so excited to have at least about 15 minutes here before we wrap up our half hour to speak with the new principal of Dr. Walter Cunningham School for Excellence. Good morning, Craig Sadler. Good morning, Tara. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. So first off, just tell us a little bit about yourself. You're new to the community. Actually, uh, returning to the community. Um, some time ago, um, my wife and I actually relocated to the Waterloo area, and we uh, were both UNI grads, so we have some roots um, that stem back a, a few years. Uh, we actually started my teaching career at the lab school when it was still here. Um, it was a wonderful time for me to explore my teaching career. Um, and immediately leaving the lab school, I actually started in a position as an administrative assistant with the Waterloo schools um, prior to leaving and assuming other positions across the state and now returning back as principal. So you've come full circle in your life. Absolutely. Talk about what you did once you left our area and how that has shaped where you are in your view of education. Um, immediately after leaving um, the Waterloo Schools, uh, we moved to Ohio. I had, a, I had an opportunity to work on my doctorate degree out there, so we lived out there for three years, um, during which time I was working on my, my doctorate in educational leadership while simultaneously serving as assistant principal in a suburb of um, Cincinnati Public Schools. So that was a very, um, very rewarding um, time. Uh, while I was serving in those capacities, uh, my phone rang and an opportunity to return back to the state of Iowa presented itself, um, at which point in time, I assumed the principalship at Mark Twain Elementary in Iowa City. Um, after serving in that role for, for a few years, um, I had an opportunity to also serve as principal in um, Cedar Rapids, and most recently in Des Moines. Um, but right prior to um, serving as principal at, in Des Moines, um, I also had a chance to return back to you and I, um, both my wife and I, for a brief stint, um, joined the educational leadership faculty, um, Department of Educational Leadership at you and I. And um, that was also a very rewarding experience. And it just seems like we kept trying to find a way to get back to the Cedar Valley area. Now I have an opportunity to permanently do that has presented itself. And you mentioned your wife. Talk about what your wife's doing with one of the schools. I think people would be interested to hear that, like you said, it's a family of educators. Absolutely. Um, she's now serving as a family support worker at Highland Elementary School. Um, this actually feeds there uh, quite well with her um, social work background. Um, her bachelor's was in social work uh, from University of Florida. Um, she also then received her master's of education here at UNI and she was working on her doctorate at the University of Iowa at the time when I was serving as principal down there. So let's talk about Cunningham, your new charged assignment. I mean, what is it that you see right now as your biggest accomplishment that you can carry forward? What's happening behind those doors that you want to share with the community, shot from the rooftops? There, there's quite a bit that's happening over at Cunningham right now. Um, whenever you have an, uh, I like to view it as an opportunity uh, where we had 16 um, new teachers coming in with um, fresh with new ideas and um, energetic and ready to um, just kind of face their careers in education, um, providing um, an atmosphere where we're able to share with them the pre-existing culture mm -hmm. that was present at Cunningham um, and also providing them an opportunity to inform that culture. That was one of the major things that we wanted to try to accomplish coming um, through the door. So um, in uh, some of our earlier staff meetings, um, that's exactly what we focused on. Um, since Cunningham's approximately 12 years old, um, several of the staff that have returned back to Cunningham this year have been there from the very beginning. Some of them may even go as far back as being a part of the initial grant um, elementary staff that came across to Cunningham. And we opened up a dialogue focusing on, you know, what was the narrative on Cunningham 10, 12 years ago? what it was a narrative five years ago, um, what is the perceived narrative today, but most importantly, what is the narrative that we want to create 10 years from now? And that work starts today. So um, it was an excellent opportunity to transmit a lot of the school pride 
that was present from the staff that has returned um, to those that are now joining the staff and have joined in with that school pride and um, start the process of starting to develop those practices that will form that narrative 10 years from now in terms of what is that story of Dr. Walter Cunningham's school presence. I love that that makes sense. What is the narrative moving forward? And you know, I have to say for me, when I came to this community about 11 years ago, I was so fortunate that when I got into the school mentoring program, I became a mentor to a little girl at Cunningham who's now an adult, and we've carried that relationship over, but it, it got me in the building once a week. And what I loved about Cunningham, and what I think anybody who visits that school will tell you, and you know, this is the environment, it is such an amazingly controlled environment of learning that as an outsider coming in was just so impressive. So just remind people about what is so unique about maybe maybe it's the culture of Cunningham that has set it apart, but also it's a year-round approach. Absolutely. Um, I certainly have to give a lot of credit to my predecessor, um, Ms. Crowley. Um, she, she for prior to my arrival, she was the um, the only principal that Cunningham had had experienced, and um, she uh, she was also the principal at Grant prior to to that process, and um, she put a lot of hard work into putting in place processes, putting in place procedures, um, setting that on the bar um, to help the school reach its own definition of excellence in terms of um, excellence in the classroom, excellence in the hallways, excellence out in the community. Um, there is definitely a, a, a very strongly expressed commitment towards excellence, not only for what is expected from students, what is expected of staff, what is expected of everyone that steps into those doors at Cunningham. Um, the, the theme that has um, existed throughout the years is, um, if it's to be, it's up to me, which really focus on everyone doing their own individual part to hold up that banner of excellence at Dr. Cunningham School for Excellence. If you're just joining us, this is Tara Thomas with Waterloo Schools. I am joined by Craig Sadler. He's the new principal at the Cunningham School for Excellence, and excellence has been an, an overarching theme of that school since its inception, as Craig was just mentioning. So we want to talk more about what Cunningham is also known for, and that is community inclusion, parent involvement. So tell us how that shakes out in terms of what you guys do and then where that door extends to open toward the community. Well, it, it always starts with an open door policy. Um, whether it's a parent, community member, um, extended family member, um, anyone who wants to come and be a part of what's happening at Cunningham, there's always an opportunity to come and learn more about what we do. Um, we, we've been very busy towards the start of the school year, but not so busy to where we don't have the time to sit down with any community member, any parent that wants to come down and sit down and have a conversation with us. So I guess one of the first messages I'd like to share out with the community is, whether it's with myself, any member of our leadership team, um, just feel free to give us a call. We'd be more than happy to sit down and have a conversation about the more specifics about what's happening. Um, the things that are happening specifically at the school. Um, that being said, we also have um, several um, after-school events that take place in which we invite the community to be a part of um, what are the different things that are happening at the school, uh, whether it's different um, um, extensions of learning that's happening in the, in the classroom um, versus um, different celebratory events in which we're asking parents to come and be a part of the celebrations that are taking place. Um, one of the, the new things that we're in the process of trying to get launched is um, at our uh, PTA meetings, uh, we've announced that we also would like for our PTA meetings to be a forum where parents can also come and get questions about school and non-school related um, issues resolved. So with our various parts of education that we have, we have access to a number of different resources throughout the community that can speak to a host of different needs that parents may have. Uh, we don't want to just um, be about the business of talking about reading, writing, and math, as important as those subjects are. But if parents would like to have additional information on how to um, open a bank account, how to get that first home mortgage, um, how to improve the quality of their lives in any particular area, we want to make sure that we can do our part as a resource within the community to bring that information to, the, to, the, to those parents in those PTA meetings. So we're, we're trying to really do our best to try to educate all members of the community, wherever they're coming from, whatever that needs may be. I like that. So you see the role of Cunningham going beyond just serving the needs of the parents, grandparents, of the children in the building. It's, hey, we want to be a community partner. We want to connect people and help be a clearinghouse by which they might be able to get the help that they need to better their life. 
Absolutely. We have so many generous partners that are, that are funneling resources into Cunningham that we feel that the only thing that we can do is be responsible stewards to try to help get those resources and the other information back out to the various community members that we serve. And we should mention one of the proud Cunningham partners is KBBG, this very station, Greg. So I have to give a shout out to KBBG for partnering with Cunningham. And when you talk about all the good things going on, you know, I think it would be, I would be remiss not to say, what are some challenges that you guys are dealing with, not just in Cunningham, but that you see with education in general that you would want to address on a more public stage? Well, there's also, there's always a changing landscape that you have to deal with. At Cunningham, this, is, this has become a very real reality, given the fact that the entire leadership team is new, as well as we've, uh, we've brought, on, brought on board 16 new teachers to the Cunningham team. Whenever you have such a wide-scale shift of that nature, um, there's a lot of work that's going to go into um, transmitting the expected and desired culture moving forward. So um, it doesn't happen overnight but we are each committed and continue to do whatever is necessary to continue to improve each day upon the previous day as we continue to move forward. So whether we're talking about student achievement and trying to help students continue to move forward, whether we're talking about a collective achievement in terms of what we're trying to accomplish as a building, our goal always remains to improve upon the previous day as we continue to move forward. And one last thing, why would you encourage parents, grandparents who have children that might be future students in Cunningham to check the building out, to give Cunningham a try, I guess, sell, sell all the great things you know are happening in the classrooms. Well, one of the, one of the selling points, I think, is the fact that we, we strive to be inviting to any and all um, parents, to all students. Um, we, we definitely do our, our absolute best, and uh, we have a number of resources, and we try to be very responsible in the distribution of those resources to meet students' needs, wherever they may be. So whether there's a student that may be hindered with a disability of some sort, uh, whether we're talking about a student that is um, um, extremely proficient and is um, demonstrating gifted and talents um, beyond the scope of the, of the curriculum, we challenge ourselves to continue to do everything we can to meet each of those students and wherever their specific individual needs may be to help them to become the greatest student that can be possible. Well, that's awesome. And what, off the top of your head, can you tell us what number are we looking at enrollment-wise this year at Cunningham? Wow, it, it's really, um, it's jumped up. Yeah, it jumped a little bit higher than we thought it would have this year. Um, we we're hovering somewhere around 470, okay. actually, right now, which was an increase. Um, we actually had to add another kindergarten classroom after the start of the school year based upon the increase in enrollment um, that we received um, since the school year started. So um, we're very, uh, it's, it's what we call one of those good problems <laughs> that Absolutely. we have to, to deal with in the sense that whereas it wasn't anticipated in the room would be that high, we're certainly glad there are so many community members that have expressed um, continued support for the Cunningham School and the Cunningham team. And you talk about some of these after school activities off the top of your head, can you think of the next event coming up or what somebody might want to get engaged with that they don't have on their schedule thus far? Absolutely, we have um, actually our flash programming that will be starting next week Tuesday. Um, students should be in the process of bringing home um, parent permission slips um, and flash is an opportunity each Tuesday and Thursday um, for students in grades kindergarten through fifth grade where there's additional academic supports that are provided by our own staff. Um, our staff stays an extra hour um, after school to provide the, uh, extended programming for our students aimed at um, remediating any academic gaps that may be present. So um, our work extends beyond the school day and um, we just do our very best to try to make sure we can do that. We also have an upcoming fall festival um, that will be coming up here very shortly where flyers will be coming out to the community. Okay, am I getting the cue here? Are we out of time? All right, I want to thank Craig Sadler from Cunningham for stopping by and just remind all of you that we'll be stopping in a couple times a month to update you on what's happening in the Waterloo Schools. This is Tara Thomas. Have a great day. Thank you.